Hey, welcome in everybody to the latest edition of the Royal Take as I am joined here by the great Ryan Bizarro again. That gives you the great stats. If you don't follow him on Twitter, I don't know what the hell is wrong with you because when it comes to the Reading Royals and other teams, he provides great, fantastic stats. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Joe. Thanks for having me back on. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's great to have you on. Um, it's fun to go back and forth um, on the team and talk about well, one, the last time we talked about the wonders of the regular season that got us to the point of being this successful at that point. Now we get to talk about how we closed out clinching the division and now have home ice for at least three rounds, depending who ends up, if it's Toledo or not, going to the Kelly Cup, if that's where we want our Reading Royals to go, end up going in the end. But let's first get into, before we get into our favorite team, the Reading Royals, who concerns us the most on the opponent, the main Mariners. First and foremost, we talked about this before starting this podcast. In net, they have a good tandem of Stefanos Lakis, who's coming up with a goaltender of the week, the second to last season, or the second to last season, the second to last week of the season. And then Jeremy Brodeur, who's obviously the son of Martin Brodeur, and has been good this year, but more just starter level, where Lakis has been stud level this year. But if, if you were the coach of the main Mariners, what would be your decision uh, when it came to goaltending going into game one? Going into game one, I would start Lekas for a reason you said. He was the goalie of the week two weeks ago. So, And I think he has playoff experience last year with Fort Wayne, and, and they made it always to the finals. So having somebody that's familiar with playoffs, even though Rodor is the bigger name because of his last name, you still go with Lekas game one. He's yeah, yeah, Lakers, uh, Lakers to me has really had his breakout season this year and has really earned the right, like you hit it on the head as well, basically saying the same thing just with different words, has hit it on the head every moment you wanted him to this year because I said it before the broadcast, Nick Masters, a guy that won the Flyers Cup for my high school. So the only team I watch in the ECHL as much as Reading is Maine because I'm, rep- I'm following a guy from my high school. Now, obviously, I'm rooting for Reading in the series, but... I'm just saying the team the team I know the most about other than Reading is Maine, even though I tend to try to watch at least 10 games from other teams other than the ones that are dreadful that you just don't want to watch 10 games. From. <clears throat> but that's beside the point. <clears throat> we can now go into the defense of the Maine Mariners and how they have a guy that to me is one of the most fun guys to watch in the league but pisses you off when he plays your team, <laughs> Connor Doherty. Because he can <laughs> yep. pass well, fights the hell out of anybody, and is just a good all-around defenseman. Probably their best defensive defenseman, honestly, and shot-blocking defenseman, because Nate Callen's definitely offense before defense. And Malatest is solid on both ends, but definitely more offensive than defensive. You could argue Doherty might actually be their best defensive defenseman, and then Kim really emerged this year. But if you had to pick a guy that scares you the most, or two, since they do have a pretty good offensive punch defense, Pesky's emerged this year as well. Who would be the guys that you would be watching out for and putting like the, that kind of star, make sure they don't beat you tag, so to speak? On defense, Doug, you said def- definitely Doherty. There's a reason why he wears the C on his jersey. He's definitely the leader, and he was definitely a foreign in our side. Last weekend, when Maine was here for the free and free, there was... I could tell Brendan Sonny wanted to fight him at one point, but hopefully we'll see that in the series. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll see that. Maybe not Sonia due to the size of Doherty to Sonia, but yeah, maybe Frank uh, or Braden fighting a Doherty would work out. Or uh, better yet, Will McKinnon uh, fighting, fighting a yeah. Doherty would work out really well. Uh, but I definitely feel you. I think the fight of... Now, that fight would actually be awesome now that I think about it. Mac against Connor Doherty yeah. with how well Max played and already stepped up and had a, a great fight. Yeah, Mac again, yeah, actually, that's something I want to see now that I now that I put that into the air. Like, that's something I actually want to see happen. Um, but <laughs> when it comes to me, since you picked Doherty, somebody for me that really has emerged for this team, uh, as I was just saying, is Michael Kim, who played for the Iceman last year and played all right. But he's played when he's been able to play for the Mariners in 33 games this year really well and has kind of taken a step forward that he could be that guy that you expect Malatesta to do great, obviously. You expect Doherty to do great. 
but he could be that guy that you're not expected to do great, that has great games in the playoffs. That's that guy that you're like, oh, crap, now we have to watch out for this guy too, because that always happens in every sports postseason, but particularly in any hockey level postseason, you have those dark horse heroes. And I think on the defense here, Pesky is going to be the their dark horse heroes if they have one. Um, so those are the guys that to me would be interesting to follow if you're the Royals, because Malatesta and Doherty, you you know you got a game plan for them. And then Cowan, you just have to worry about more in the offensive zone if he's even in because he's been healthy scratch some game. Uh, so you have to worry about him more in the offensive zone than you ever have to worry about him in the defensive zone at this point of his career. <clears throat> Absolutely, for sure. But offensive-wise, I'll turn it to uh, – you first for the main Mariners. Who out of two people since they do? We talked about this starting. They have a lot of depth on offense, just like our Royals. They have, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, nine, ten. They have ten guys above 20 points. So that's a pretty that's pretty good depth uh for them. And then Brendan Robbins has become a very good player at the end of this season. He's really got hot at the right time. So you also have him who finished the season with 16 points. Who would be somebody that you look out for that you know you have to mark in the series as a forward and also potentially someone that you just know the Royals have to mark as a forward so like he doesn't beat you because he's always been stepping up against the Royals? Well, I would go with Pascal Oberge. He's somebody at Royal Sanctuary. Remember, he played with us the, during the COVID year, and it looks like the injury bug finally is behind him, which I hope – I actually like Oberge as a player, but I hope he stays quiet this series. Yeah, I would hope he does too, but he's definitely a player to watch out for that. I definitely agree with. For me, Yuri Leone, just because he seems to step up his game against us this year, even in games he hasn't got points, you hear his name – from Eric so many times for touching the puck. Uh, he seems to really play up on his skates against us. Uh, he's somebody that I would definitely look out for. Um, and then bleakly when it comes to fighting, that's definitely someone I wouldn't mind seeing like low or somebody uh, drop their gloves with either. And then obviously Santos, I would definitely like to see Brendan Sonne drop. He's somebody, he's the guy I would really like to see Sonne have the forward for forward fight. See Sonne and the big tough guy. It's obviously very good offensively as well. It's Santos kind of go toe to toe. That would that would be cool. That would be that would be a cool one. Um, but goaltending for the Royals. We started with the goaltending for the Maine Mariners. Now let's go to the goaltending for the Reading Royals, where Brody Clay's in his debut almost fought the other team's goaltender. So got to give him a clap up for that. Good for Absolutely. him for stepping sure. up for the team. Uh, and then he only really let in one goal that was bad. Uh, other than that, he played like a backup goaltender, which is what he basically has been his entire career thus far. So he's played to, to advertise. And then Hayden Hawkey had a fantastic final game. So mm -hmm. when it comes to if Flo is not back by Wednesday, obviously if Flo's back by Wednesday, this is a moot point and Logan Flodell was the starter. Kirk McDonald's already made that loud and clear. And then Patty Nagel might be coming back down at some point once the Phantoms allow him to come down. But Sandstrom is also kind of up with the Flyers now because of Hart being out for the season. But between Clays and Hawkey, who are you going with? Since if you look at both goaltenders, one, just eyeballs wise, but two, statistically, they're kind of the same type of cats that are just very good backups that are not ride or die starters, but you're going to have to pick one of them, obviously, if Flodell ain't down. Yeah, we talked about it before this, we started recording. I would start hockey if Flodell Camp isn't here by game one. Hockey has more experience with the team, so we know, the team knows how to play around him. And he, like you said, he looked good last night recording a shutout. Granted, he didn't have much action in the first two periods, but he made some key saves in the third. Yeah. Yeah, to me, I would say Hawking needs to be the starter because familiarity is key, especially in the postseason. And Brody Clays is always there if you need to use him if Flow is a bad first game and you or not Flow. If Hawking has a bad first game and you still don't have Flow, you could always go with Brody at that point because you know he already played solid for you in his first game and already showed the ability to step up for his club in his first game, which is very good to see. So I honestly don't mind. 
like those two as goaltenders. I think they're both good backup goaltenders. Just obviously, I would much rather have Logan Flodell starting. But if we had those guys starting with how good our team is around those guys, I'm not thinking, oh, we're we're screwed for the series whatsoever. I'm still confident that we can win that series because I'm confident in Hayden Hawkey and how he's been able to be a good backup for us this year. And then Clay's has kind of been that his entire career for other teams. So uh, I'm also fairly confident in him. Yeah. But uh, when it comes to our defense, um, obviously that's stacked. And we also have Garrett McFadden and Ryan McKinnon, both up with the Lehigh Valley Phantoms right now. Um so when they come back down, that stacks the defense even more. But to you, who's been your standout star of the defense uh, this season? I have two players. One, Dominic Cormier, and also the guy on my back right now, Mason Millman. Cormier's had an offensive outburst for a defenseman. I think he had 13 goals this year, which led our blue line. And Mason Millman, 16. I love him. 16. Even better. Yeah, even better, yeah. And Millman, I loved his play since he's come down here. And I've heard K Mac and Garrett Cockrell talk about him last night in the post game press conference for being a 20 year old. They love his style of play. And I think he's going to get better as the postseason progresses. Yeah, he's a guy. He's definitely one of the most dangerous guys to have for any team going into the postseason because he plays wise above his uh, years and is already potentially the best defenseman on the no no disrespect to Corbs or McNally. It's just Millie's definitely gonna be, it looks like an NHL defenseman at some point by the time he's age twenty three or twenty four. Corms and McNally might eventually get a cup of coffee in the NHL, but I don't know if they're ever going to be steady NHL mm-hmm. defensemen. So uh but they're both great at the ECHL level. Having a guy like Millman play his entire season with the Royals is one of the biggest blessings that the organization actually finally gave the Royals, which doesn't come a lot to the Royals, uh, because they wanted him to have comfortability in one place and be able to develop with the best developer, which is Kirk McDonald in the organization, because Kirk McDonald also saved Matthew Strong's career that Scott Gordon almost destroyed. So uh, we don't have to get into that right now because that's an entire different conundrum that would be here until next Easter. Disgusting. <laughs> Uh, but um, that's something for a different time. But let's just know that I do not like what Scott Gordon did with that Strom. Uh, so just like I don't like – it's something with the Stroms because I also hate what Jeremy Colleton did with Dylan Strom. Like the reason Trish Strom probably follows me on Twitter is because I'm always defending her sons like I'm their agent because I literally am like, <laughs> no, no, go. no. You are stupid, Jeremy Colleton. What are you doing? And I literally yeah. said the same thing last year when it came to um, – What's his name? Scott Gordon, where the only guy I actually like has been Gallant and whoever was there. I'm forgetting the guy's name but with the Rangers before Gallant because he actually played Brian Strom in, in good spots. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's enough about the Strom family. Uh, when it comes to the defense, you kind of hit it on the head. Millman and Corns, I think, are the biggest guys, but also having McNally, who's one of the best ECHL defensemen. A guy, a guy that obviously is just one of the best steady Eddie guys in that league. Block shot, great in the defensive zone. Obviously more of a passer than a goal scorer in defense, but also has potted seven of those, so he can do that as well. I would say he and Will McKinnon being a rookie that's just going to consistently get better. Uh, he's come in and just been a dynamite force for the Royals. Those would be my two um, to look out for because Will McKinnon, like I said, I really hope that fight happens. Doherty and McKinnon would be uh, an absolutely <laughs> vibrant fight. The place would be like literally probably vibrating with noise uh, if that fight happened. Like that would be rid- that would be ridiculous and awesome to be played on. That'd be cool to see. Then we get the crowd into it early for games one and two because you know this, Joe. Because you go to games, we don't sell out every game, but when so, Those fans get into it. It gets loud. Yeah, it doesn't matter how many are in the uh, Satan Gear. Whenever there's fans like, getting into it, that place gets loud quick. Like, like the the fans, especially everybody that does show up through and through, they get loud as hell. And then, obviously, playoff crowds are amazing, so it's going to be fantastic to get to see that again. Um, so uh, I think when it comes to this year, there's just a different 
feel like you had a feel to the 17 Eagles. There's a similar feel to this Royals team that even has more skill at the ECHL level because they're one of the deeper teams. Or nobody considered the Eagles one of the deeper teams in the NFL in that 17 year. They just kind of had that underdog vibe to them that fueled them. With the Royals, it's more well, people kind of countered us out compared to Newfoundland because we don't have all these AHL contracts. We have all these ECHL guys. So essentially, they kind of did a backwards underdog mentality themselves because it was like, well, screw them. We're still really good, <laughs> even though we have a bunch of ECHL contracts and they have like 13 AHL contracts with the uh, with the uh, Broward. So like, the, realistically, they kind of did play off of that a little bit, but the biggest thing for them is, and I'm sure you agree with this, the recruitment level of Kirk McDonald and the development level of Kirk McDonald and obviously scouting that he has around him with Henry, uh, James Henry and others uh, to be able to scout talent has been ridiculous because you get to bring in the McKinnons. Uh, you get to convince the organization having Millie down with you is the best. You get to bring in the Fidels. You brought in Hawkey as a backup you somehow got Brady Clays to come out of thin air when we really needed a goaltender. So that was nice. Um, so, like, it seems like, honestly, Kirk McDonald's like Cosmo and Wanda sometimes. And it's like, oh, wait, we don't have enough skaters for tonight. It's like, oh, yeah, some guy was walking down the street that used to play three years ago, so we decided to dress him. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, it's like, like, it's like he literally, like, he always seems to find people. Yeah, for sure. And like we talked about before the pod, bringing our team is mostly guys on ECHL deals, so you're not worried about losing a guy at Lehigh for a weekend or a month. You have the and same locker gonna, room. Yeah, and you're probably not going to lose Mo at this point because what the heck would the Phantoms call him up? Like, he is yeah. on the AHL, but like that would just be disrespectful at this point to Redding if the Phantoms called him up because they have no reason to. He barely played in the one game he went up there. Honestly, they disrespected him for one game. Uh, yeah, but sure. um, and he's been killing it down here. So yeah, I, like I don't think you're going to lose him. Critch, obviously, fantastic. Ebbing's been electric. Gooch is an absolute stud, and then Bykoff is your points leader. So he's ridiculous, obviously. Um, and also one of the nicest people you ever meet. Um, yeah, and one of the most humble people you ever meet. That thinks he's not great at things. He's literally obviously fantastic at um but it's nice to have um but uh kenny halsinger also you've talked about him i've seen in tweets so i'll let i'll I'll twist this one to you uh but halsinger and his emergence how um electric and how big that's been for our royals absolutely i talked about last time i was on i have housing housinger as our rookie of the year I know he's been cold as of late, but he scored that crucial goal on Friday to help us clinch the division and guaranteed us at least a home ice for the first three rounds of the playoffs. If he can get it going in the playoffs, watch out. He'll be great on like our second or third line. Yeah. And as we was as I was saying about uh, Mac and you were saying about others, he's not even close to being done growing yet. So the fact that he's already been this good, next year I see him let's see. Points, points per game. He was at 0. 0.7 points per game. I could easily see that going up into at least 0. 0.8, 0. 0.85, mm-hmm. and then continue to grow from there. Like I see him growing as an all around talent as time goes on. And maybe eventually he does get a chance at the Phantoms. But um, for now, he's definitely a great talent to have with the Royals. And you would just encourage that, just like McDonald uh, does, Kirk McDonald does, whenever guys do get chances. Um, a guy to me that I have liked that's kind of just been overlooked just due to the simple fact that we have so much talent on this team, but I think is a great talent himself at the ability to win faceoffs, the skating speed he brings, is Cressy. He's just not a whopping off the charts guy when you watch him. He's just a guy, if you really watch him, does every small thing of being in the right spot on defense, being on the right spot on offense cutting down all the lanes, being quick to the puck and everything, winning battles. He does all that stuff where it's not as noticeable, even though he does still have like 12 goals and 14 assists, which is still really good. Uh, but like, he's not always as noticeable compared to the Pritchard, Morrison's and Evan, where if Cressy was on certain teams, like Adirondack, he would have a way higher, I would say, points total because he would also be much higher in the lineup. Where with the Royals, you're not like you have 
Kirk McDonald's kind of said it himself. When you have guys like Bichara, you got Morrison, you got Pritchard, you got Ebbing, you got Gucci, you got Bykoff, you don't have room to put Cressy in your top six consistently. So by default, he's just not going to get the points he would get on other teams. It doesn't mean he's any less of a player, though. It means he's just a fantastic player that's doing the role that he fills. So if I had to pick uh, a guy that's not my other guy that I was going to pick, he's the guy for the playoffs that's definitely the dark horse that could just go ballistic guy, like kind of that R.J. Umberger playoffs that, that he had for the Flyers years ago. Like, he's the guy that could definitely just go bonkers. Uh, but if you had a guy on the team that you think would just go bonkers out of nowhere uh, from the forward core, who do you, not out of nowhere, but bonkers, like, had you go from being, like, say, a point seven, point six, whatever they are, points per game, to being, like, a points per game guy in the playoffs, who do you think that would be? If he, I'm, I'm going to go with Jacob Pritchard. He, he was our all-star this year, and he, I know he hasn't played in a while, but looking at his numbers now, he had 52 points in 58 games, so if he can come back, He'll be a great player to have for sure, especially on that power second power play line. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Pritch is one of by far one of my favorite um, players on the team. And then one of the guys that I this is the dark horse guy that I was telling you about that I wasn't going to bring up until the podcast because I think um, it might be surprising to some, but I think a lot of people know. Uh, that followed me how much I like this kid in his six games he's played. I think Conley could be a dark horse guy in the players because having a guy that's a power forward come in this late in the season, that kind of plays like Alex Kyle did for the Mariners, but bigger because he doesn't care, even though he's only six foot. Kyle's like 5'8". Conley's six foot 192, but plays like he's 6'3", 214. So like having somebody like that in the postseason – I think it's really going to help. He also already had an assist and two goals, so he's not like he played bad. Uh, he had that great goal the other night that was a snipe. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think he's a guy that can shoot the puck. Um, he's a guy that's great in the offensive zone. He might not be fantastic in the defensive zone yet, but we have enough guys that are that that's fine. So I think he's a guy that could become a very solid commodity in the playoffs that the Royals picked up late again, goes to the scouting talent of Kirk McDonald uh, because I think he's a player that just plays that jam style, playoff style that you want to add when the Royals already have a bunch of those guys in the char low Sonia that they brought in late, obviously that got sent down surprisingly from the Phantom. So that was a blessing. Um, and then you have others like Hosinger who play good getting in front of the net. Now you just add another guy who obviously it works in the regular season as well because we were the best team in the conference. But it also works in the postseason, having those guys that have jam. And then also, Kurt McDonald pointed it out, and I kind of agree with him when he said, even some of our skill guys, like Bykov's such a skill guy that he said he doesn't get enough credit for how much he does sacrifice with block shots and actually still trying to hit guys off the puck and sacrificing his body. Because when you get labeled as a skilled guy, the stereotype is always, oh, that guy's not that physical. Where a lot of the times nowadays, that's not even the case. Where Nathan McKinnon is a very skilled hockey player in the NHL, for example. Nathan McKinnon is also one of the most physical hockey players in the NHL. So two things, two things at the same time can be true. Where Gooch is one of the most skilled players, and Gooch also has laid out multiple people that we've seen at games. that So like, I don't think skilled player with not being physical. So I think Kirk McDonald was smart to point that out. But as we wrap up the, the tail half of this video, I think the biggest thing would be to go over what are three. We went over the key players, but what are three keys like they always do in the broadcast? What would be the three keys to a successful series? And what's your prediction for the series? How many games? Uh, against okay. the main Mariners here. All right. So first key, staying out of the penalty box. You and I have talked about this on Twitter. We had less than 700 penalty minutes this year. That's astonishing for a team that played 71 games. I think the second closest team had like 800 or something. So staying out of the box against a team that against Maine that has a very physical power play is going to be crucial. And on the other side, my, my second key, we got our power play going. It was good in the beginning of the year. 
it's gone ice cold lately, and now it's slowly picking up again. So hopefully you can get better as the series progresses. And my third key, hopefully getting depth from Lehigh Valley. Once their season is over, we talked about Pat Nagel hopefully coming back, Garrett McFadden, Ryan McKinnon. Don't, I know we talked about it earlier. Don't sleep on Charlie Girard. He's a little fast forward who's not afraid to shoot the puck. Yeah, especially at the E. Like, he's been good for the fan of the bat. The ECHL level, there's a little bit more, obviously, more space. His speed plays higher there than it does uh, at the A. So I think he's a big asset. I agree with you there. Matthew Strom's my guy that I love, that I think is going to be a potential stud if he comes back down in the playoffs because he's played great as a 4C. And I wouldn't even mind if the Flyers let him play 4C instead of Nate Thompson and use their last call up on him to round out the season, to be quite honest. Uh, but if they don't do that, then he will actually, if they do that, he could actually come down two days earlier because the flyer season ends on the 28th. So actually, yeah, flyers call up Matthew Strom so he can come to yeah. um, two, two days early. Um, but no, like uh, he's a guy that I think would be pretty good if he comes down because he's already established himself, I think at this point as a bottom six AHL or, and we see Sonia, who's established himself as a solid bottom six AHL, come down and own it immediately as a speedster. They play a little bit different style. Strom's a box out power forward. Sonia's a small guy that plays with a lot of grit. But I think Stromer would do really well. He's kind of my guy to watch coming down from the fan. And then we know, we already all know how good Garrett McFadden's able to do when he plays his best. So that's not real. That's just a given, basically. Um, but. Yeah, my, I mean, you basically hit all the keys on the head, but my biggest key for the main Mariners uh, beating them is you got to do what we did in the first 10 minutes of the Friday game. Now we talked about pressure them early on five on five because they're not the most efficient five on five team. They're fantastic on both special teams. They're 82%. The Royals have a very good PK, actually. It's 80%. The Mariners are one of the teams that's actually above it. They're 82%. So, like, if you even get on the power play, there's no, absolutely no given that you're scoring against the main Mariner. So, and then if they get on the power play, there's not no given that you're scoring. Like, like obviously, the Royals PK is very good, too, but you want to stay out of the box because they're a very good power play. It's going to be interesting in that aspect if there's a game that gets sloppy because both teams have very good PKs. Whose PK falls apart the, yeah. the, the, the quickest? Uh, because both teams have very good PK. So that's kind of a, an interesting tidbit uh, to follow in the series. But my key is to try to get some of the dirty but good goals because Lakis and Brodeur are both very good goaltenders if you give them good sight line. Try to continue like the Royals have done most of the season with Lowe to Char, and now with Saunier down, uh, with Kevin Conley now there as well. Keep the net front presence happening keep the crash, the net happening and you're, and you're going to have good success against Maine. And as you said, keep them out of the box and you're going to have good success against Maine. And then hopefully flow is obviously back down. That's a big key for me. Uh, so we can just kind of have a great uh, run in this series where I think it flows not down. I think we're still going to win the series, but it might go deeper uh, where it flows down. I feel like it's at most a five game uh, series. Yep, I agree. I was about to say, I have us winning it in five. I, if we can get the first two wins at home, which we are really good at home this year, this year we shouldn't come back to writing for a game six. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think uh, Flo, having Flo down, like I said, I love Hawkey, but Hawkey obviously is, more, like we said, a very good backup. Flo's become a brilliant starter this far for the Royals. Uh, he's a key to being able to win in five. I would push it maybe to six if we have to put a guy, one of the backups in in Clays or Hawkey, because they just have more of a chance to not allow bad goals, but allow, like, not be, because they don't really allow many bad goals, so that's not how I want to phrase it. They just have more of a chance to not be able to rescue you. Like, if you if you have a really bad play, Flodell's a goalie that can rescue your team and just make a ridiculous save. Hockey and Clays aren't really that. That's kind of the way to put it. Yeah, and hopefully we can get a, if we can get this series quick. Hopefully the new fan one trois series. I've talked about this personally. I want that series to go seven and multiple overtime. So the, the, whoever wins that series is fatigued for when they come here. I think we would play TR in my opinion better just with how hot Newfoundland's been. Where TR started great, went a little bit down. 
then started playing better again towards the tail end. But, like, since they've had inconsistencies where Newfoundland's just been fire, like, hot as firecrackers, yeah. just like the Royals are close out the season, I would much rather play TR because I think there's more. We're not going to talk about that on this video. We'll talk about that in a future video because that'll just make this extra long. But I think there's more holes the Royals can exploit with uh, Trois Riviere than there is with the Newfoundland Growlers, and that's why I would rather play uh, Trois Riviere. I agree, but we got to worry about Maine first, and that begins on Wednesday. Can't wait. Exactly, yeah. That's why I said we'll talk about that later, because that's something we don't have to worry about yet. But, Ryan, I really thank you for joining me again on the latest edition of the Royal Take here on Sports Fanatic News. Please continue to subscribe, ladies and gentlemen, down below to help us grow to the goal of two-thirds of the world by the end of April. We really appreciate you guys' love and support this far. Ryan, did you have anywhere you wanted to share to uh, – have people follow you or anything like that? Uh, sure, yeah. If you want to, you can follow me on Twitter at Ryan Bizarro. I post Royals news frequently, and I'm also I also have a Royals and Phantoms fan Facebook page where I post game updates frequently. It's called Royals and Phantoms Hockey Central. Okay, um, I actually have to check that out because I didn't even know you had a Royals and Phantoms uh, Facebook page. So I have to check. I'm in the other ones. I don't think I'm in yours, so I'll have to check that out. I'll have to check that out as well. So I can invite you to it then. Yeah, definitely. I check that out, everybody. But I uh, really appreciate you all for joining. This has been the preview to the playoffs as our Royals are trying to go to the Kelly Cup. But first, they got to take care of business with the main Mariners and then hopefully the Trois Riviere Lions over the Newfoundland Growlers. But like I said, we'll get to that when we get to that. Uh, but peace out, everybody. Stay safe and enjoy the hockey. The Royals are playoff bound, and the playoffs are almost here.